But, uh, but if you're just joining us, uh, we are just over halfway through. We're six weeks into this uh, epic survey of the rise and fall of the kings of Israel. And as I've said uh, each Sunday, the Old Testament chronicles this epic story uh, of the kings, the, the dynasty, really, of Israel. And it's full of... Uh, conflict and bloodshed and spiritual awakening and conspiracies and adultery and idolatry and, and all sorts of, of other things uh, as each would-be king contends for the throne of Israel. And as we've seen, some of Israel's kings were good and godly men who, who wanted what was best for their people. Others, many of them, in fact, were corrupt and conceited and contemptible and each of them claimed the throne of Israel, but only one of them would be worthy to sit on the very throne of God. Now, last Sunday, we looked at the reign of Israel's most notoriously evil ruler, King Ahab. Ahab was a corrupt king who allowed his wife Jezebel to lead him and all of Israel to worship the dark prince Baal. And he was a competitive king who sought to prove that Baal was superior to Yahweh in this competition with Elijah on Mount Carmel. And he was also a covetous king who literally whined and cried when he didn't get his way and didn't get the things that he wanted. Because of Jezebel's influence, the Bible says that Ahab did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any other king before him. So while Ahab ruled in the northern kingdom of Israel, and, and all of the people there suffered under the evilest king in Hebrew history, the southern kingdom of Judah experienced a succession of much more godly kings. Uh, king Rehoboam's grandson Asa inherited the throne of Judah while Jeroboam was still king in Israel. And King Asa ruled for 41 years. The Bible says in 1 Kings 15, 11, Asa did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight as his ancestor David had done. Um, and after a, a lengthy, uh, successful reign as king, King Asa died and he left the throne to his son, Jehoshaphat. And that's who I want to focus on this morning. In fact, Jehoshaphat, it's just a fun name to say. You should try it a few times, Jehoshaphat. Um, <laughs> but uh, but he, he was a unique king in Scripture. And the Bible actually says about him in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 32, Jehoshaphat was a good king. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And if you'd like to, to follow along in your Bible, by the way, Jehoshaphat's story is told in 2 Chronicles chapter 17 through chapter 20. And as we examine the reign of King Jehoshaphat, we discover five, not three or four, but five defining features of his throne. The first of those defining features was King Jehoshaphat's father, the king's father. The Bible makes a point of repeatedly mentioning King Jehoshaphat's father Asa and the positive influence that he had on Jehoshaphat's life. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 3-5, through 5, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father's early years and did not worship the images of Baal. He sought his father's God and obeyed his commands instead of following the evil practices of the kingdom of Israel. So the Lord established Jehoshaphat's control over the kingdom of Judah. And then the Bible also adds near the end of Jehoshaphat's story, it says Jehoshaphat was a good king following the ways of his father Asa. So when Asa inherited the throne, he banished all of the, the male and female prostitutes from the land. And he got rid of all the idols that his ancestors had made. He began essentially cleaning up the mess that his predecessors had created. And, and the Bible says in 1 Kings 15 that Asa's heart remained completely faithful to the Lord throughout his life. Asa was obviously a good and godly king, but perhaps even more importantly, he was a good father who set a godly example for his son. Jehoshaphat is living testimony to the unparalleled impact that fathers have on their children. 
You know, a child's first hero is their dad. And kids, especially boys, tend to follow in the footsteps of their father. You know, we do what, what dad does, not what he says, but we do what he does. Um, I'm reminded of a, a young pastor who was also working at a, a rock quarry in order to make ends meet. Uh, his name was Jerry Steen, and, uh, and he worked at a rock quarry in Salina, Ohio. And each night when he came home, his boys would look at him and say, Dad, you sure are dusty. And he would say, yep, I sure am dusty. And, uh, and one day, it was a Saturday morning, he got up and he came outside to wash the car, and he noticed his oldest son, who was then four years old, picking up rocks from the driveway and wiping them all over his pants. And he's like, son, what are you doing? And the little boy said, I'm going to be dusty like you, Dad. If, uh, if a son will admire and imitate his father because he's dusty, then he will admire and imitate you for anything. And that's why it's so important for us to set godly examples. You know, the words that, that we read there in Second Chronicles 7, 17, verse 4, he sought his father's God. And that's true for just about every child ever. King Jehoshaphat's father set a godly example for his son, and that set him on the path to becoming a great king. Now, another defining feature of Jehoshaphat's reign was the king's faculty. The king's faculty. Thanks to his father's godly influence, King Jehoshaphat went on to become a godly influence throughout the entire kingdom of Judah by establishing a new educational initiative. The Bible says in chapter 17, verse 7 and following, In the third year of his reign, Jehoshaphat sent his officials to teach in all the towns of Judah. They took copies of the book of the law of the Lord and traveled around throughout all the towns of Judah, teaching the people. So this educational initiative involved assembling a teaching faculty that included multiple royal officials, several Levites who were temple servants and usually familiar with God's word, and a pair of priests. And this team of teachers then traveled to all throughout the kingdom, to all the towns, teaching the people the word of God. And this is, I think, perhaps the most impressive and insightful thing ever done by any of the kings of Israel or Judah. King Jehoshaphat recognized that the people of Judah had strayed so far for so long from God that many of them didn't even know the basics about who God is or, or what God wants from their lives. And so they took the Bible, the, the book of the law of the Lord, to every town and village and hamlet in the kingdom and simply taught the people what it said. Folks, this, this is how you change a nation. This is how you get revival. You know, the Bible is the most powerful and persuasive tool for national reform that we'll ever have. And our founding fathers recognized that. You know, John Adams, one of our, the signers of the Declaration of Independence and our second president, once said, Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible as their only law book and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts therein. What a utopia, what a paradise that region would be. And his predecessor, of course, President George Washington, said it more simply. He said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. If we want to make a difference in the world, if we want to change our country or our culture for the better, the best thing we can do is follow King Jehoshaphat's example and just teach people the Bible. Now, you and I may not be able to initiate a, a nationwide program like Jehoshaphat did, but we can take personal responsibility for, for getting people into God's Word. And we can start at home by teaching our children or grandchildren. We can invite friends and family to small groups or to Sunday school. We can have personal one-on-one -on -one Bible studies with neighbors and coworkers. We, if we want to see revival or positive change in our nation, it begins with the Bible. The king's faculty, his 
team of Bible teachers and his desire to get God's word into the, the hearts and hands of his people set Jehoshaphat apart from all of his predecessors. And although King Jehoshaphat is shaping up to be one of Judah's greatest kings, he still wasn't perfect. One unfortunate feature of Jehoshaphat's reign is the king's friends. Jehoshaphat's one downfall seems to be that he didn't choose his friends very wisely. In fact, believe it or not, this godly king befriended and made an alliance with the evil king Ahab in Israel. See, when Jehoshaphat came into power, Ahab was already in power in Israel. And in order to form an alliance and to keep peace between the two nations, Jehoshaphat offered to have one of Ahab's daughters marry one of his sons. And a little while later, the Bible says a few years later, he went to Samaria to visit Ahab, who prepared a great banquet for him and his officials. They butchered great numbers of sheep, goats, and the cattle for the feast. And then Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to recover Ramoth Gilead. Now, Ramoth Gilead was an Israeli city that had been conquered and, and captured by the Armenians. And Ahab wanted it back. So he convinced King Jehoshaphat to join him and lend him some of his army so that they can go and invade and retake this city. And Jehoshaphat is, I, I got to say, he's got to be a little naive because he is kind and generous and he's like, you know, absolutely, I will, for sure I'm going to help you out. And I'm, my people are your people. My army is your army. Let's go. Let's do this thing. We'll, we'll rescue the city, set them free, and then you can, you can have your city back. And so they get out there and they, they form this alliance. They get out on the battlefield and King Ahab does one of the most despicable things imaginable. See, in, in ancient warfare, whenever you're in battle in one of these situations out on the battlefield and you see a guy wearing uh, purple robes and a crown, that's the guy you want to kill, right? You see that guy and immediately, that's the target. We're going to take out the king and then the army will disperse. You'll win the battle. So what happens is Jehoshaphat brings his army out onto the battlefield and King Ahab brings his army out onto the battlefield. But then Ahab takes off his royal robe and his crown and disguises himself as an average soldier. And so when the Armenian army spots Jehoshaphat, they mistake him for the king of Israel. And they target him, shouting, there's the king of Israel, let's get him. And so all the, the commanders of the, the chariots start chasing Jehoshaphat. Thankfully, the Lord saved Jehoshaphat and kept him safe. And King Ahab got what was coming to him when a stray arrow pierces right between the joints of his armor and kills him in battle. But when King Jehoshaphat arrived safely home in Jerusalem, a prophet named Jehu went out to meet him. And he says to him, this is in 2 Chronicles 19, Why should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of what you've done, the Lord is very angry with you. Even so, there is some good in you, for you have removed the Asherah poles throughout the land and have committed yourself to seeking God. See, God um, didn't punish Jehoshaphat for befriending King Ahab, but he did chastise him and criticize him for it. And there would be long-lasting repercussions from this friendship that he made with King Ahab. Unfortunately, Jehoshaphat didn't learn his lesson because years later, Jehoshaphat formed another alliance with Ahab's son, King Uzziah who was nearly as wicked as his father was. Uh, the two kings built a, a fleet of trading ships together, but once again, the prophet of God confronted Jehoshaphat about it in uh, Chronicles chapter 20, 2 Chronicles 20, saying, because you allied yourself with King Uzziah, the Lord will destroy your work. And so the ships uh, met with disaster before they ever left port and they never set sail. Jehoshaphat learned the hard way that we need to choose our friends wisely. Jehoshaphat's friendship with Ahab 
cost him, nearly cost him his life and would have long-lasting repercussions that we'll get into in the weeks to come. But his friendship with Isaiah cost him a, a whole fleet full of ships. And when believers, especially those in leadership positions, become allied with unbelievers, values can be compromised and spiritual awareness dulled. And the Bible repeatedly warns against associating too closely with immoral influences. Uh, we read it, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? So why is it that God wants us to not get too close to unbelievers? Well, because as Paul says elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 15, do not be misled, bad company corrupts good character. Or as my mom used to put it as a kid, one rotten apple spoils the whole bunch, right? You know, while it's absolutely essential to maintain evangelistic contact with unbelieving friends and family, we also need to be very careful that we don't allow negative or evil influences to rub off on us. Now let's learn from Jehoshaphat's mistakes and choose our friends more carefully. Now, an, another defining feature of Jehoshaphat's reign, however, was the king's fairness. Jehoshaphat was a just and fair king who wanted to ensure his people were always treated fairly. And so he instituted wide-reaching social and judicial reforms. The Bible says, uh, back in chapter 19 again, he appointed judges throughout the nation in all the fortified towns. And he said to them, always think carefully before pronouncing judgment. Remember that you do not judge to please people, but to please the Lord. He will be pleased with you when you render the verdict in each case. For Fear the Lord and judge with integrity. For the Lord our God does not tolerate perverted justice, partiality, or the taking of bribes. So Jehoshaphat also established, in addition to these judges that he placed in every town throughout the kingdom, a sort of supreme court that met in Jerusalem, uh, where he appointed Am Amariah, the high priest, as supreme justice over all religious matters, and Zebediah, uh, a tribal leader, as the supreme justice over civil matters. This new judicial system served two primary purposes. First was to ensure that the people of Judah remained faithful to God's law and were held accountable to it. Remember, the Old Testament laws were given not just as religious or ceremonial laws, but also as civil laws. You know, the book of Leviticus contains laws about sexual crimes like rape and incest and, and prostitution and misdemeanors like theft and robbery and fraud and, and social issues like fair wages and border disputes and, and the proper treatment of slaves and foreigners and animals and, and violent crimes like murder and manslaughter and, and assault. And, and so after sending teachers into the land to teach everybody what God's word said, establishing this judicial system was the next logical step in restoring order and obedience throughout the entire kingdom. By teaching the citizens God's word, he turned their hearts back to God, and by establishing these judges, he held the people accountable to God's word. And the second purpose of this new judicial system was to guarantee justice and equality for every citizen. Jehoshaphat commissioned each of these judges to judge fairly and with integrity. You know, not to show favoritism or partiality, not to take bribes, and not to worry about you know, the popularity of their verdicts or their decisions, but to focus instead on, on doing everything to the glory of God and making the right choices because they're right. The judicial reforms implemented principles and commands that God had already given. Uh, for instance, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 5, God says, Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. 
and similar commands are scattered all throughout the Old Testament. Yahweh is a God of fairness and justice, and He wants His people to be just and fair as well. Now, you and I may not be in positions of power or authority. And we don't wear black robes or have gavels, but we can still do our part in our personal lives and in the public square to advocate for justice and fairness. You know, Solomon advised all believers in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19, yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see that they get justice. Jehoshaphat you know, took steps to ensure that justice would prevail in his kingdom, and we should do the same thing in our own lives. Now finally, in addition to the king's father, the king's faculty, the king's friends, and the king's fairness, the final defining feature of Jehoshaphat's throne was the king's faith. And Jehoshaphat has already demonstrated vibrant faith in seeking after his father's God and tearing down the pagan shrines and by teaching people God's word throughout the kingdom. But there's one last story about Jehoshaphat that really highlights his faith in God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, three enemy kingdoms, uh, Moab, Ammon, and Mount Seir, combined to declare war on Judah. Military scouts uh, spotted this vast army marching toward Judah from, from beyond the Dead Sea and immediately sent word to King Jehoshaphat. And the Bible says in chapter 20, verse 3 and 4, Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. And, uh, and the king, so he issued orders to gather all the people, all the men, women, and children of Jerusalem in the courtyard out, out in front of the temple of Yahweh. And he led the entire, the entire city in prayer. And he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6 through 12, O Yahweh, God of our ancestors, you alone are the God who is in heaven. You are ruler of all the kingdoms of the earth. You are powerful and mighty. No one can stand before you. We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. And, and before he could even say amen, the Bible says that the Spirit of God descended upon a temple servant named Jehaziel, and he began prophesying. And he says in the following verses, Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not even need to fight. And immediately, King Jehoshaphat just falls down on his face. He bows down to the ground and praises God and begins singing God's praises. And all the people of Jerusalem followed his example and they just knelt down and began praising God. And early the next morning, Jehoshaphat led his army out to the battlefield. But on the way, he stopped and turned to his men, saying in chapter 20, verse 20, Listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. So he sensed that they were afraid. He knew that they were worried. And so he stops and, and he makes this announcement to just have faith. Hold, in, hold your ground. Have faith. And then what he does is he appoints singers. He draws out like the talented vocal artists in the group. And he puts them at the very front of the, the parade as they march toward the battlefield. And these singers lead the entire army in worship as they approach the field. And they sang Psalm 136, which says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. And as soon as they began to sing and praise, God caused the armies of Amnon, Moab, and Mount Seir to turn on each other. This alliance that they formed fell apart, and they suddenly started attacking one another. And so when the army of Judah reached the lookout point where they could see the battlefield down below, they looked out, and all they saw, for, for as far as their eye could see, were the dead bodies of their enemies. Just as God had promised, God gave them the victory, and they didn't even have to fight. They went down to ground level, 
everybody was either dead or running away, and they were able to stand on this battlefield victorious, never even had to lift a sword. And so all the soldiers of Judah returned to Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat leading the way, just overjoyed that the Lord had given them this, this great victory over their enemies. And they paraded into Jerusalem to the sound of, of harps and lyres and trumpets. And they marched into the temple of the Lord for this, this huge citywide celebration. And, and so the story here provides this perfect ending to Jehoshaphat's reign. When King Jehoshaphat faced this life-threatening crisis, he didn't panic. He didn't try to handle it himself. He didn't turn to pagan gods or false prophets or help from other kingdoms. He simply turned to God. He pleaded for God's help. And when God promised victory, Jehoshaphat had total faith that God would come through for him. And we all face crises and catastrophes and calamities at times. And the very best thing that we can do is follow King Jehoshaphat's example. Turn to the Lord. Trust in the Lord and praise the Lord no matter what comes our way. And the Bible puts a bow on Jehoshaphat's story. Uh, in verse 30, it says, So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. The king's father set a good and godly example for young Jehoshaphat. The king's faculty taught God's word to the entire kingdom. The king's friends were terrible influences that, that cost him a great deal in his life. But the king's fairness ensured justice for all the people. The king's faith shined brightly across the kingdom and pointed all of Israel back to God. It's hard to imagine a better king than King Jehoshaphat, but Israel's game of thrones isn't over quite yet. There's still more conflict, conspiracies, and carnage in store for the kingdom of Israel and Judah as they await the arrival of the one true heir to the throne. In the meantime, if you're ready to put your faith and trust in God the way that Jehoshaphat did, then I want to invite you to come talk with me. You can pull me aside after church, or you can call me at home, or you can just come forward now while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.